Hello YouTube, we all juggle knives here, going to be discussing a blockbuster movie that came out this year with a zombie theme, World War Z. Yes, uh, I review cutlery here on YouTube, and so in the background of this video it's just going to be scenes of uh, some swords and so forth that might have been useful uh, to these characters in this zombie movie. You know, because I review cutlery, many of my subscribers are into uh, books, movies, and computer games that feature the whole uh, doing battle with zombies theme. Yes, I know they're not real, but it's a big trend. And I just saw this movie just last week, all right? Now, apologies if this is your favorite movie, but it had some it had some serious problems. That doesn't mean you can't just like the movie for what it is, all right? You can like it, but... Um, yeah, this video is going to be everything, everything that was wrong with this movie. You know, this movie could have been so much more of a better movie, especially for the 300 million freaking dollars they spent. All right, so let me get right into it. I took notes. <clears throat> this might be a long video. Hey, you know, if you're really into this topic, that shouldn't bother you. And if not, check out my other 500 videos on various... Uh, swords, machetes, and uh, folding knives. All right, let's get into this. First thing wrong with the movie, uh, Brad Pitt's wife is British in this movie. Now, you might think, what does that have to do with anything? Uh, yeah, exactly. Nothing. It does not affect the plot at all. They just waste time. They just waste this little scene and dialogue establishing that she's British for no reason, you know. It's not like she, you know, has some relative in Britain and that becomes really important later. No, no, it's just randomly she's British. Um, yeah, they should have edited that little scene where they established that out. All right, second of all, Brad Pitt himself, and I'm not going to refer to him by his name in the movie because there's no act. <laughs> there is no acting in this movie. Brad Pitt looks like he's drugged up throughout this movie. His eyes are really wide. He looks like Tom Hanks looked in Castaway after the first two hours of Castaway where he was just going crazy from being on the island. He just doesn't have normal reactions. And, you know, I don't buy that it's all just from shock, okay? You know, the shock can last a while, but, I mean, he looked like he was on drugs. That's it. All right, now, his character... Okay, get this. His character plays what I could only describe as a United Nations-like Special Forces Commando type. But, but, here's the thing. He's not the type that kills anyone. He goes into these dangerous countries. They mention Sri Lanka and a Afri place in Africa and Chesnia and all this. And he, like looks for evidence of, of war crimes, and he, like, delivers medicine, and he's, like, this super good guy, yet badass ninja who works for the United Nations, all right? In other words, he's a type of character that does not exist in real life, you know? Um, and, and here's the even stupider part. At the beginning of the movie, he no longer works for the UN, okay? But... He has a personal hotline to basically the second in command of the UN, like the vice, the vice president type equivalent, you know, the undersecretary general, yeah, whatever. He has a personal hotline to him, and that guy dispatches a helicopter to go pick him up, like wherever he is, like on highways, on top of buildings and stuff like that. And he dispatches this helicopter in the middle of basically the start of the end of the world where everything's chaos, but somehow the guy who doesn't even work for the UN anymore, you know, take, <laughs> takes priority. Okay. Another thing that's horrible about his character, they try to prove what a badass he is by having another random character who just entered the screen literally like 10 seconds before some random military guy basically reading off Brad Pitt's uh, resume, like, oh, you've been in Sri Lanka, you've been in Chechnya, the most dangerous places. All right, 
you know, movie making 101, if you want to prove someone's badass, you have to do it with action. You don't do it by some random guy just reading his supposed resume, <laughs> all right? Um, uh, here's the other funny thing. Okay, Brad Pitt is supposedly this super survivor type that has that has been in countless like civil wars and civil collapses in the most dangerous parts all around the world. All right, but for some reason, even though he's seen you know people eating each other and everything, he doesn't carry a gun. Like at the beginning of the movie, he's he's in America. He doesn't carry a gun, okay? Um, I don't know. I think if I had survived like 20 civil wars and seen uh, civilizations degenerate into anarchy, chaos, cannibalism, and so forth, I, you know, don't you think he would carry <laughs> a gun? But no. Oh, and here's the other thing. He's supposed to be prepared for anything, you know, the ultimate survivor. He also forgets to carry a spare asthma inhaler for his daughter, <laughs> okay? So, yeah, um, not quite the prepared survivor. All right. There is a scene in this movie early on. I call it the creepy... It's a super creepy scene where his young daughter asks him, Daddy, what's martial law? And Brad Pitt laughs and he says, Oh, martial law, it's, it's just like house rules, you know, but for everybody. Okay, now, when I first saw that scene, I thought it was foreshadowing, like, oh, okay, so, you know, later there's going to be this scene that declares martial law and everything. Uh, no, there's no scene like that later on. It basically goes from everything's normal to just complete chaos. Like, there's no time for them to declare martial law or make any official thing. Um, you know, it's kind of implied that they would, but there's no scene for it. So... The part where he talks to his kid, it, it was not foreshadowing. It's just a random, extra, creepy scene where, uh, where the United Nations guy explains to your children that martial law is just like the rules in your house, <laughs> okay? That's weird. I don't know why they would waste time. Like, why didn't they edit that out if it's not foreshadowing? I don't even know why they put that scene in. All right. So... They're in Philadelphia at the beginning, and the world starts to end with zombies. Um, this garbage truck... Well, first of all, they're in traffic, and they're stuck. It's like bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. All right? And they're so tightly packed in that a police motorcycle can barely get through between the two uh, lanes of cars. In fact, the motorcycle even hits the... Um, uh, the, the window, okay, the side window, or the side mirror, I should say, of Brad Pitt's car, all right, so shortly after that, like a minute after that, this garbage truck appears out of nowhere, going like 80 miles an hour, and goes right next, you know, goes right by Brad Pitt's car, and, you know, it's running away from the zombies, but here's the thing, there was no room at all for this giant garbage truck to have even built up that speed. Because if you look at the scene, there's so many cars packed in behind him, it would have at least had to push those cars into Brad Pitt's uh, car. Okay, so that just makes no sense. And to top it off, this garbage truck is supposedly like... It's hitting the cars in front of it so hard that it's not just pushing them in front of it, it's actually launching launching entire vehicles through the air, like as if Godzilla picked it up and threw it. And it doesn't even slow down when it hits these vehicles so hard that they fly through the air. And there's like six or seven cars that fly through the air out of its way, and it doesn't even slow down. Um, yeah, that's not what ha well, first of all, it couldn't have even built up enough speed, but even if it had, um, that's not what happens, you know, when a garbage truck hits, hits uh, five or six cars, okay? It would have just pushed them all in front of it, all right? So yeah, the magical, the magical garbage truck, not very realistic. All right, next, when, when the zombies start overrunning Philadelphia, 
like, within five minutes, literally, like, fucking five minutes, uh, military troops appear with military uniform on the streets. Okay, first of all, were these troops just, like, randomly inside a building in Philadelphia? Okay. <laughs> Maybe I could buy that some, for some reason, there was a, a military unit in the city at that time. Um, but was there also time to, like, phone, you know, for the president and, and the, the, uh, the governor and everyone to, like, order the troops in? Okay? I mean, there are police, you know what I mean? Like, that would seem a pretty fast turnaround to, like, have, have military troops within five minutes when you wouldn't even know what was going on within that time, but whatever. So, yeah, troops magically arrive, even, like, uh, uh, Humvees with, like, machine guns or grenade launchers on them arrive, <laughs> okay, and an A-10 Warthog squadron flies by. They fly overhead. And at first you think, oh, okay, you know, they're just, the movie is just trying to say there's emergencies everywhere, all right. But then it happens again, and the first time there's, like, three Warthogs. The second time there's eight. There's eight A-10s flying around. And here's the thing, they don't bomb anything. Like, there's no scene where, like, you know, a big park is full of zombies and, like, the A-10, like, blasts a freaking maverick or opens up with its, uh, 35 millimeter on them. There's no scene where they shoot anything. So it turns into, like, why the hell are these A-10s just randomly flying around? What the hell? It's, it's a movie. At least have them blow something up the second time. <laughs> All right. Now, since Brad Pitt doesn't, ha doesn't think to carry a gun, um, he has to rely on a bolt-action hunting rifle, which his daughter finds in an abandoned RV. <laughs> okay, and now this rifle has a scope on it throughout the whole use of, of it in the movie. It has a scope on it, uh, but Brad Pitt never uses this rifle for any long-range shooting. It's all, like, literally room distances, and half the time it's, like, bad lighting. It's, like, crappy lighting conditions that you you couldn't use the scope anyway. So, yeah, it just, it just randomly has the scope on it for no reason. All right, so when they're looking for the asthma medicine that dumbass Brad Pitt forgot to pack, you know, or forgot to carry... Um, there's rioting and looting at this store. So while he's looking for the medicine, two guys try to uh, rape Brad Pitt's wife in the middle of the aisle, like just, <laughs> just in the middle of the aisle of this store. You know, they don't, they don't drag her anywhere, you know, to do it. And so Brad Pitt shows up with that hunting rifle and starts shooting. Okay, and these must have been the bravest rapists that were ever existed because when the angry hus husband starts uh shows up shooting with the rifle what do the rapists do do they just run away and like you know find any of the thousands of other potential victims in in the uh the collapse of civilization <laughs> no no the the would be rapist i guess he's so hot for Brad's wife that he actually stands in the middle of the aisle pulls out a semi-automatic handgun, like a freaking, not even seeking cover or concealment. I don't know, was he supposed to be on crank or something? Uh, and he just, like a gunfighter at high noon, decides that he would rather have a shootout with the angry husband with a rifle rather than just run away to live another day. And he can't manage to shoot Brad Pitt, even though Brad Pitt at this point is sitting on his ass. He, like, falls down or something. He's sitting down in the aisle, struggling to work the action of the bolt-action rifle. And he can't, he can't hit him, okay? And so Brad Pitt kills, like, the bravest rapist in the world, apparently. Right? Oh, and, and after he kills him, Brad Pitt, the super ninja survivor, it doesn't occur to him to take the guy's semi-automatic handgun... You know, he just wants to use this bolt-action rifle. Uh, he doesn't even add, you know, to his weaponry. Uh, yeah, he just leaves that gun there, 
you know that that was really intelligent of, of him um all right so they're running around he still has the bolt action rifle uh, eventually he takes some duct tape and he makes he duct tapes a kitchen knife to the end of this rifle to make like a little bayonet okay now a weapon like that like a piercing weapon like a spear does not work on zombies because zombies don't have vital parts like unless you put it through their skull I guess but um, so when he's fighting off these zombies he like stabs one in the chest and the zombie just reacts like as if the zombie was a living person you know it just kind of stands there shaking its arms and, and dying even though it's already dead and they don't ever explain why the zombie didn't just like walk right up the the gun barrel right up the spear shaft and eat Brad Pitt anyway because a, a puncture to the chest of a zombie is not going to incapacitate it at all. All right, so he has this magical bayonet. All right, and at one point Brad Pitt gets some zombie blood in his mouth and he thinks he might be a zombie. All right, and he even like goes to the edge of the t the roof of the building so that if he turns into a zombie, he'll fall off and he won't kill his family. And he waits like the 12, 8 to 12 seconds, and it doesn't happen. So he thinks for for some reason he's like, okay, I didn't turn into a zombie. Um, but at that point, how does he know that he's not a carrier? You know what I mean? Like you can be a carrier of disease and not show symptoms. So how does he know that he's not going to infect his whole family when he, like, you know, the next time he kisses his wife or, you know, how does he know he's not a carrier? A carrier? He doesn't. He, he just assumes it. All right, whatever. So after the initial uh, zombie apocalypse, uh, you see this fleet. Um, he's eventually evacuated to this fleet of ships in the Atlantic. And, you know, realistically, this fleet is going to be 90% U.S. Navy warships, right? We have carry, we have 12 carrier battle groups, I mean, um, but anyway, so what is this fleet called? What, what letters appear on the screen? It's called the United Nations Atlantic Fleet. All right, I guess, I guess in the zombie apocalypse, the United Nations also just ma magically took over America, okay? And now at this point, when they're at this fleet, there's a huge cliche, which I'm going to call people in uniforms looking official and doing all sorts of official things, okay? There's just people bustling around and, and saluting each other, and a lot of, you know, time and effort is wasted in the movie just trying to say how important it, important all this is because people in uniforms are, are shuffling around and they're at desk and they're looking at monitors and it's just one of those giant cliches in a movie. All right, and so at one point they established that 5% of the zombies don't change into zombies immediately, all right? And then they say the, the big cities fell first because the airlines were the perfect delivery system. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, a zombie can't get on an airplane, so you're going to have to assume that the airlines were a delivery system solely, solely through the 5% that don't change into zombies immediately. <clears throat> okay. But those people still had to be bitten by a zombie. So you're supposed to believe that a sufficiently large number of that 5% were bitten by a zombie at some point in the day. And then, you know, they didn't go to a hospital or anything. They got onto, <laughs> they got onto their airplanes with a festering zombie bite on their arm. <laughs> okay. And, you know, they weren't quarantined or anything. And when they started changing, you know, nobody restrained them or just beat the crap out of them on the airplane or anything. But, yeah, supposedly sufficient numbers of the delayed reaction zombies somehow got on their airplane flights after being bitten that day and managed to spread the infection through, <laughs> through all parts of the world. All right, yeah, because when, when a crazy zombie bites off a part of my forearm, the first thing I do is, like, get right on my airplane. I don't, 
I don't like go to a hospital and make sure that it didn't have you know communicable disease or anything. I just fly right to uh, to to freaking Amsterdam. All right, so Brad Pitt is at the UN fleet, and he agrees to take his old job back and try and investigate where this virus came from for the United Nations. But he only agrees to do this because they say if he doesn't, that his family will be considered non-essential personnel and they won't be allowed to stay on the safest place, which is the ships. All right, so he says, okay. All right, later in the movie, as soon as they haven't heard from him for a while and they think he's dead, the U the UN, which promised to take care of his family, uh, ships them off. They, they ship them off to a refugee camp anyway, okay? And then when Brad, Par Brad Pitt does come back and, you know, kind of saves the world, he doesn't even mention this. He doesn't even call them on, like, you vowed if I did this, you would take care of my family. And then when you thought I made the ultimate sacrifice for you and died for the mission, the first thing you did was ship them off to a fucking Arctic concentration camp. Uh, he doesn't even mention that. He's just like, okay, you know, thanks for betraying my dead memory, you know? Well, that, that was great. Uh, I guess the lesson is just don't, don't make deals with those people. Okay, now let's talk about Brad Pitt's magic cell phone. He has this magic cell phone that works anywhere in the world. So when he goes on his mission, uh, his wife can call him on the magic cell phone. They each have one. All right. I assume it's supposed to be some special satellite cell phone because it's a lot bigger than a normal cell phone. And it's like coated with black rubber. Okay. <laughs> um, now that that's just silly enough on its own. But when she calls him in the middle of their stealth plane refueling mission and uh, the ringing phone alerts the zombies and the zombies charge and kill a bunch of, you know, his military people. That's, okay, he's supposed to be this ultimate ninja commando, but he doesn't remember to turn off the ringer on his phone during their all-important stealth mission, okay? So that's the second funny thing about the phone. And then next, the phone eventually runs out of batteries, even though... He's only used it, like, for, I don't know, like, maybe three conversations that were, like, a minute each on the screen, right? So he hasn't even used it, so it, it's wasted all its batteries. It, it must have the worst batteries ever. And, of course, Brad, the super survivor guy, never thought to bring extra batteries, <laughs> okay? So, yeah, um, that's all the funny stuff about the magical cell phone. Okay, also, at one point, he's escorting this, like, medical genius PhD guy um, on the mission to try and find out where the virus came from. Uh, so what happens to the, the genius guy that he's escorting? Um, they give him a handgun without proper training, and he accidentally trips and shoots himself. Uh because his finger was on the trigger of the handgun. Okay, so we're supposed to believe that um, the last, you know, super genius virologist guy on Earth, we're supposed to believe that he is unable to, to operate a handgun, uh, even with the instruction of, like, the Navy SEALs that were there. Okay, yeah, I, I, a genius cannot cannot operate a handgun apparently because they're so they're so dangerous. That's just an anti-gun message right there in the movie. All right next, uh, Brad Pitt for some reason has to personally go to Israel. He first went to South Korea and talked to a bunch of people at that base, and the people there. One person tells him that Israel had been prepared for the zombie outbreak and he and he wants to know why like how did they know okay what what the hell happened to the whole atlantic fleet of like carriers and submarines and destroyers how is the atlantic fleet not in communication with israel if israel has not yet been you know over Overwhelmed by zombies, it's like a, a little fortress with all their military and satellite stuff still working. 
how come Brad Pitt had to find out about Israel from some dude in, in South Korea when the, the entire fleet would have been talking to the Israeli military command on the satellites this whole time? Okay, but no, no, Brad Pitt is somehow the only one who found out about Israel, okay? So he has to fly there. As they're flying there, they randomly see a mushroom cloud, like from a nuke, um, below their aircraft, just randomly. Okay, now I get that they were trying, the movie is trying to say, man, look how crazy things have got, a nuke is going off. But they don't explain why at all. Like, not even, like, a single garbled radio message or something, or, like, some last message, like, you know, our base has been overrun, we're self-destructing the, the nuke we had, or, you know. No, no, nothing like that. You randomly see a mushroom cloud, and that is the last you ever hear about that in the whole movie. It's not even important in the movie, apparently. Okay. So he gets to Israel, where they have created a gigantic wall around the entire city of Jerusalem. <laughs> okay. Um, but they start making noise, like there's a lot of people milling around and refugees, and they start praying and singing really loudly. And the zombies are attracted to, to sound. So all the zombies outside the wall start going insane and, and trying to scale the wall. All right. Now... <laughs> So the Israelis knew about the zombies enough ahead of time to build a gigantic wall around an entire city, but somehow they didn't know that the zombies are attracted to sound, which is something Brad Pitt figured out, you know, within one or two encounters with them. But like, you know, the entire, <laughs> the entire intelligence structure of Israel couldn't figure out that the zombies are attracted to sound. Okay. All right, <laughs> whatever. So the zombies walk up to this wall and start building like a tower of zombies to scale the wall. All right. Um, why were the zombies allowed to just walk right up to the wall? Why wasn't there like a, a 2,000 meter kill zone in front of the wall with like artillery sighted in and like air strikes ready to go and heavy weapons interlocking fields of fire uh mine minefields okay why wasn't why wasn't the wall defended like they don't even notice that anyone's going over the wall like there's no one even there's not even just one person on the top of the wall looking out okay the first they know is a zombie flying over <laughs> you know leaping over the wall all right so whatever, they, they don't bother to defend uh, their, their uh, fortifications. Um, and I get that, you know, they would run out of ammo eventually, but, you know, why wasn't every man, woman, and child inside the fortress at least armed with a baseball bat or a large, like a halberd, you know, something they could have fabricated uh, so even when they were out of ammo, you know, why weren't they organized into, uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, militia or something, even if they didn't have enough guns? I mean, they're going to die anyway. Might as well fight it out. Why weren't they making Molotov cocktails, etc.? No, they were just milling around, like singing and stuff before, before the zombies scaled the wall. All right. Now, when the zombies start to break through this fortress... The Israelis send one helicopter, a single helicopter, to try and, you know, <laughs> shoot them. And it, it's a gunship. It's not even, you know, it's a transport helicopter with machine guns. It's not even like an Apache longbow. It, it, you know, it's not a dedicated attack helicopter. It doesn't even have uh, hellfires or, or rockets or anything like that. It just has, like, you know, a 7.62 a pintle mounted machine. It doesn't even have a minigun, okay? So they go through the trouble of building this giant fortress, and there's a breach in the wall, and they only send, like, one helicopter. Okay, you know, that, that makes perfect sense. They don't send, you know, F-16s with napalm or anything like that. They just let the fortress be breached that easily, right? Now, the military in this movie are depicted as... as Horribly, they're depicted as completely without thought. 
Uh, all the military people in this movie, they never use any fire support. They, they never call for heavy weapons. They don't have tactics. They don't have kill zones. They don't have a layered defense. They don't use snipers. Uh, really, well, a little bit, but not as much as they could have. You know, they don't use uh, 50 cal uh, sniping rifles. They don't have like interlocking fields of fire and all this. When they retreat, they don't have like a, a, a staged retreat where some of them cover the rest, you know, in phases or anything like that. The military just, they line up right next to the zombies and they shoot them until... There's too many zombies. And then they just die. The, the, the soldiers, without any tactics or anything, they essentially just get run over and die in place. All right? Uh, you know, like the Maginot. <laughs> it's like the Maginot line over there. And in every fighting scene, Brad Pitt is running away. All right? Yeah, you know, <laughs> the great hero guy, he's, he's running away in every single scene. All right? Oh, and they have these frag grenades... Now, if you're fighting zombies, like, shrapnel going through them with small puncture wounds, it's not really going to hurt a zombie that much. I don't know why they didn't issue them with uh, incendiary-type grenades, like white phosphorus, which would just melt the zombie, okay? So, yeah, wrong type of grenades for zombies. Um, oh, and when he finally evacuates Israel after it's getting overrun, um, again... Brad Pitt doesn't think to pick up a gun when he's evacuated. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't think to pick up any of the frickin' hundreds of abandoned weapons from soldiers or weapons that would be in fortified positions around the airport. He doesn't think to bring a gun. So Brad Pitt apparently just doesn't like guns in this movie. Right. Oh, and at one point in the movie, they say that it's a virus and... Just like all viruses, it can be cured by a vaccine. Um, so the movie is trying to rewrite scientific facts, saying that every single virus in the world can be cured by a vaccine. Uh, if that were true, then, like, you know, there'd be no more viruses. Uh, that's definitely not medically true. There are many viruses for which, uh, for whatever reason, we have not been able to make a vaccine. Okay, so that was just, you know, that was just wrong right there. So, when he's evacuating Israel on another airplane, a zombie stows away in, like, a closet on the airplane. <laughs> Nobody explains how it thinks to do that. And also, it's a rotting zombie, but no one, no one manages to smell the rotting organs and flesh and, and pus that would be oozing from the dead body that is the zombie. All right, and the zombies are attracted to sound, but for some reason, the zombie in the closet never, never goes crazy and busts out of the closet, even when like you know kids are getting on the plane and they're crying, they're shrieking, you know people are making noise, putting their bags away, and and all this. Cell phones are ringing, whatever. But the zombie just plays dead, <laughs> no pun intended, in the closet until randomly like a little yapping dog makes a stewardess open it, and then the zombie pops out. And instead of the passengers immediately beating the crap out of the single zombie, all right, because these passengers are coming from a place that was overrun by zombies. They know what a zombie is, and there's only one, okay? They could have beat the living crap out of the zombie before it bit anyone, but no. <laughs> the zombie starts infecting this whole cabin, Brad Pitt is in the, the cabin in front of this zombie cabin, and there's just a curtain, okay? And apparently, nobody in Brad's cabin can hear what's happening in the other cabin, even though people are basically being ripped apart and eaten. Nobody hears it, and uh, nobody thinks to run away from that cabin into the other cabin. Like, no one tries to escape for some reason, and Brad Pitt just looks, he peeks through the curtain, all right? And even when the screams are audible, people don't panic or make... All right, and Brad Pitt, like, shushes the people because he's trying to get, you know, he doesn't want to get the attention of the new zombies. <laughs> and the people are quiet 
I mean, even little kids and old people that would never be quiet when the screams of a death massacre are happening in the cabin next to them. But yeah, you know, somehow they manage to be quiet, but then someone screws it up anyway. Uh, all right. <laughs> you know, I just have to say whatever about that. Uh, eventually, the plane crashes because of a grenade. And when the plane goes down, um, his Israeli like bodyguard sidekick girl is sitting next to him. Okay, he straps her in because one of her arm, one of her hands is chopped off. He straps her into the seatbelt, and then he straps himself in next to her, and then the plane crashes. All right, so now they're on the ground, except she's not there anymore. He's just alone in this chair, and he has a giant shard of metal that has impaled. Uh, the side of his lower torso. All right, so he try at first he tries to pull out this shard of metal, um, which is not at all the right move. Okay, you're never supposed to do that because it could be stopping bleeding. That would be fatal. You're only supposed to remove an impalement on an operating table, and if he was such a a survivor commando, like he would have known that. Okay, so. Yeah, just completely uh, <laughs> dumb move there. And uh, his sidekick girl, who was next to him when they crashed, just wanders up after he falls out of his chair. She wanders up in a blanket. Like, uh, apparently she didn't, she didn't help him at all. You know, she didn't take his pulse and see if he was alive when he was in the chair <laughs> for some reason. She just wanders around in a blanket. All right. Now, they were going to a medical facility in Wales, and they crash land, like, right near it. And, okay, first of all, somehow this medical facility has enough fuel for its emergency generator that even though it's been, like, you know, it's been several days, maybe even a week uh, since the civilization basically collapsed, but they still have power, you know. They still have lights and security cameras and their computers and, and their freezers for all the samples, okay? So they must have had a lot of fuel stored up. Uh, but as important as this research facility is, this research facility where they keep dozens and dozens of the most deadly medical samples of all the different viruses and whatnot, this place has no armed guards. You, you, you don't see a single armed guard in the whole facility, and they don't have any guns either. They, for some reason, yeah, yeah, because you're going to store, like, all the deadliest stuff in the world and not have any armed guards. And, like, half the facility was taken over by zombies, and none of the zombies are dressed like guards either, okay? And even if the guards got killed or left or whatever... There still would have been weapons if there had been guards, and they didn't have any firearms, okay? They, they had, like, a bat and an axe. All right, so, you know, an unguarded level 5 facility. Uh, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Okay, now, when he wakes up in this facility, they tell him he's been asleep for three days, and it's implied that they, like, did surgery on him and took out the shard of metal that was impaling him. And they, like, interrogate him and have him, he's, like, tied to the bed and they don't trust him and, and shit. And it's like, okay, keep in mind, he entered this facility with his, um, his Israeli uh, sidekick bodyguard girl, okay? And apparently in the three days that he's been recuperating from surgery, the Israeli girl never told any of the people at the facility, like, who he is or why he's there, or who she is, or who they could contact to confirm any of this. Like, he literally wakes up and they're asking who he is. Like, what the hell was that girl saying for those three days? And why the hell would she keep it a secret when he's tied up there? All right, but anyway, so they just act like she just was on vacation for three days. Okay, now... Half of this facility is infested with zombies, and the zombies are dormant because they're locked in to the half of the facility, and they've, they've converted everyone in it. 
Okay. <laughs> the whole idea of zombies being dormant is freaking stupid, because if you look at every other scene, the zombies just run at top speed trying to infect more and more people, and if they're in a building or something, you know, they just run and run and run until they can find more people. So as soon as they overran this facility, they would have um, smashed through the windows. That's another thing. They established that these zombies can, like, headbutt right through, like, car windshields and stuff. And this facility is filled with glass. And there's even blo broken glass around it, too. So it's proving that some of the glass was susceptible to the zombies. So as soon as they ran out of victims the zombies would have just broken out of the facility and looked for more victims, okay? But, all right, so, but apparently not, okay? Um, they say they go dormant. And also, it's been established that the zombies are attracted to sound. Now, keep in mind, the entire world is ending outside. So there would have been, like, you know, bands of survivors taking to the countryside and military units and explosions and all this would have been outside at some point. But somehow none of the zombies heard any of the freaking end-of-the-world battles that would have been going on outside. Okay, so they weren't attracted to that either. So the zombies just decided to, like, mill around inside this building forever. <laughs> okay? Uh, so next, Brad Pitt has to go to this part of the building to retrieve samples. And... It's only been three days since he was impaled by a huge shard of metal, but somehow he's fighting these zombies like he's taking full swings with a crowbar. Um, you know, he's fighting them like, I don't know, like a kung fu ninja or something. And his injuries are not even bothering him. And then a little bit like after the fight, he like doubles over and like says ouch or something. Um... Yeah, you know, I've had surgery, and it takes way longer than that for your uh, your abdominal muscles to heal and everything. Like, yeah, impossible. All right, now, near the end, like, one of the zombies um, who has a standoff with him when he's in this little sample room, because of the lighting, the zombie randomly looks green. Like, freaking green, like a goblin, okay? It looks like the green goblin. Uh, none of the other zombies were green throughout the movie, but because of the lighting, they're just randomly, he, he looks like a goblin, <laughs> okay? Um, now, he injects himself with this, uh, lethal infection, which causes the zombies not to be interested in biting him because he's not a healthy host, you know, quote, end quote. So he's walking through these zombies who don't attack him, walking through the hallway. Now, the zombies in the, the hallway, they had the cleanest clothes. Like, they had new, like, dry-cleaned clothes. There was not a spot of blood or rotten tissue or pus or saliva or just, uh, you know, parts of organs. There was nothing. These were the cleanest dressed zombies ever. <laughs> All right. Now... For, like, the, the zombies are virtually blind until they hear a noise, all right? So they're kind of out of it. Uh, but yet, the movie would have you believe that the, the virus or the zombies can somehow detect when a human being is infected with any of many possibly fatal diseases, and they don't attack those people. All right, so how do the zombies, which don't even seem to see very well, they're just noise-oriented, how do they sense when, when you have a disease when the disease hasn't even manifested any symptoms? Like, it hasn't, like, you know, maybe changed the way you smell or anything like that. Like, literally seconds after you get infected with a, a bad disease, the zombies lose interest with you because they can somehow magically sense it, Okay. And it's implied that they don't want to infect people that are not healthy because that wouldn't be a good host to transmit, so it would be a waste of their time. But the thing is, the zombies have no problem infecting people that are, like, torn in half and, and torn to bits. Like, the zombies themselves injure people when they're attacking him. Like, there's one time where the zombie bites the guy's neck and blood starts spurting out, all right? 
So they're not going to infect you if you're sick, but they have no qualms about like tearing you in half as they're infecting you. Uh, and you know, okay. So and even like zombies have torn the legs off people, and then other zombies are still attacking that person. All right. So yeah, you have to be healthy, but you can be torn apart, and they'll still bite you. And lastly, once they make this special vaccine that makes people uh, invisible to the zombies, they have scenes of dropping it in crates from parachutes into the countryside, and then a little boy opens it, and he finds, like, these very fragile-looking little bottles of vaccine, because, yes, uh, you know, that's the way to do it. Drop drop crates of really fragile vials of vaccine uh, by parachute uh, for, into the into the countryside because that makes perfect sense. Okay, that was that was my entire list of everything that was wrong with this horrible horrible movie in which um, you know I can sum it up like this. I couldn't tell which side in the movie. I couldn't tell which were the bigger zombies.